And now we'll talk about interacting with a, a single view and what are some of the things we can do for that. So, so far we've been really focused on the static visual encoding parts and now we're moving on to the interactive parts, manipulating, faceting, and reducing things within views. So, What's going on here is that we have four major strategies to handle complexity. We've already talked about one of them, which is deriving new data. So the other three are the major families of uh, interactivity. There's changing a view over time. There's using multiple views and uh, how do we facet between them. And then there's within a single view, how to reduce the number of items or attributes to show. And so that's what we're going to launch into now. So we'll start with manipulating a single view, changing over time. We're not gonna have time to about, talk about selection here in this tutorial, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues of navigation. So it's some fundamental way, a view that changes over time is the most obvious thing to do. Uh, that's the promise of interactivity on a computer. There are many, many ways to change. Any of the things that are involved in a visual encoding are things that could change um, interactively and dynamically. Let's just focus on one of them, which is reordering, changing the order or the spatial arrangement of things. So I alluded to this already when we talked about bar charts, um, that if you have a categorical attribute, it could be really useful to reorder by some quantitative attribute while uh, maintaining the bar chart. So one thing you can see here is here on the left, we have um, the frequency of use of letters sorted by alphabetical order compared to actual usage order in English. And of course, there's a lot we can see in that data-driven reordering that was just completely hidden in the alphabetical ordering. So reordering is a very powerful interaction technique. Let's actually go beyond that, not just think about a single bar chart, but what if we have uh, this data stripes interface, which is reminiscent of an earlier effort called uh, table lens, allows us to have multi-attribute tables, think of this a lot like a spreadsheet, where you can pick a column, reorder according to the data value of that column, and then see are there other attributes that then appear to be visually somewhat uh, correlated with that, it's a great way to very, very quickly and interactively explore a data set. I encourage people uh, actually to click through um, and uh, check out a lot of the interactive demos in this portion. Um, and almost everything that I'm showing you has an interactive demo uh, that is uh, down in the URL in the, in this case, in the left corner. So what else could we change? For example, we could change alignment. Remember how we talked about stacked bar charts and we said, well, what's easy to compare is the total bar length and only that first segment. What if we allowed interactive realignment? Here's an example of the lineup tool, which allows you to say where you want the alignment to be. So in the bottom one, we now are able to actually do fine-grained uh, aligned comparisons between the blue and the red bars for citations and teaching uh, because we've moved the alignment point to the middle rather than to one end. Now, let's, there's many things we could change, uh, but let's just spend a few minutes talking about navigation. So fundamentally, we can think about navigation as a way to change what items we can see. Uh, we've got this metaphor of a virtual camera, and just like your, uh, you, know, you moving around in the world or a camera, you can change what's visible uh, by, by moving. You can zoom in. Uh, there's the familiar s semantics of if we zoom in close to a camera or further away, things get bigger and smaller. Um, there's also what's called a semantic zoom, which I'll show more in a minute, where you don't just try to simulate reality, but actually dramatically you could adapt the representation of an object simply based on how many pixels are available to draw that within. Uh, so you can do much more dramatic things than simple geometric zooms. We could do what's called panning or translating. Uh, particularly in 3D, there's interest in rotation. It makes less sense. It's much less common in 2D. Um, but with 3D spatial data, rotation is completely crucial. Another thing to keep in mind is navigation does not have to be unconstrained. It doesn't just have to be that you can translate and zoom and rotate freely. You could say, let me select something and then have the camera automatically uh, move to the point where that thing I'm interested in is appropriately framed within the view. That's often a very powerful technique. You could have an animated transition uh, so that you don't have to try to use controls directly. 
Remember, people are very poor helicopter pilots in the real world. It takes training to actually fully move around in 3D. Um, so constraining navigation can actually give a lot of power to the user, uh, although it might sound like you're taking power away. In fact, usually it's adding power because it removes some of the cognitive load of having to navigate piece by piece. Let's go back to that idea of semantic zooming. Uh, this is certainly best seen interactively. Uh, so I encourage you to click through and actually see the video. We don't have too much time for that in this tutorial, so I'll just briefly walk you through. The key idea here is uh, this is a system called LiveRack that actually came out of my own lab. Um, and there's very different visual representations for these charts depending on how much room there is in each of these stretch and squish cells. So if it's a tiny, tiny cell, then we have something that's just like a heat map. There's just a single color uh, to show um, something encoded by color alone. If there's a little bit of room, we use a very uh, um, space efficient form of a line chart called a spark line, where we're just trying to show the line itself. We don't have any axes, we don't have any labels. If there's some room, we show a fairly straightforward and simple line chart. And if there's a lot of room, then we do a full chart with axes and tick marks and everything. The point being that we don't simply try to take that full chart view with all the axes and tick marks and so on and just average that down like a thumbnail image. It would be very hard to see things. Instead, we change the view much more dramatically based on the available screen area of each of those little regions. So navigation can also be thought of as reducing the attributes that you're showing, not just the items, but the attributes. So continuing with this idea of a camera metaphor, here's where we really, it often makes more sense to think about attributes as dimensions in this context. So especially if you're dealing with any kind of spatial data and you have slices of that data that were maybe generated by, for example, a medical imaging process, you can think of just seeing a two-dimensional slice, maybe of a three-dimensional image. Of course, you can also do this for higher dimensional uh, spaces as well, um, but let's just for now stick to 2D and 3D. So this could be aligned on the same axis that was used to originally sample the data. It could be arbitrary alignment, in which case you're going to have to grapple with issues of an interpolation and a lot of the things that come up with dealing with continuous data in a mathematically reasonable framework. So we could slice. We could also cut. Uh, which you can think of as essentially like a slice where then you preserve everything on the far side of that slice, but everything between you and that's the camera eye and that slice is not drawn. Um, so these are very uh, related uh, activities. Now there's a, a more um, mathematically rich thing we could do, which is project. We could have projections from some higher dimensional space down into some sort of image plane. Uh, we don't have time in this tutorial to get into the glorious world of projections in full detail, although it's great and I highly recommend it. Um, I'll just say that there are many options, for example, using um, simply orthographic projection where you throw away entire dimensions, uh, perspective projections where you're doing something that, that simulates what we see in reality with real world scenes where distant objects look much smaller. Um, there's a lot of interesting projections for dealing with uh, cartographic and geographic data. Um, so many, many different projections um, beyond the scope of this tutorial, but just useful to get you thinking about projections and slicing and cutting as essentially ways of reducing the number of attributes that you're dealing with, in addition to other ways of thinking about reducing the number of items that you're dealing with. Again, we've got further reading. And now we'll wrap up and take questions before the next snippet.